Psalm 147 shows how God heals the brokenhearted and then uh, receives and brings restoration to the outcast in all this. And yet he's also the same guy who names the stars in the sky and shows how his omnipotence, how powerful he is, omniscience and omnipotence. This is a God that no one can neglect or just brush by. Psalm 147, praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is a pleasant thing and it's fitting of praise. For the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. Now let's just expand on this. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. And of course, these days, when you read the word Jerusalem, you know, in the New Testament, essentially it speaks to the spiritual Jerusalem, which is the church. But this is actually spoken in the Old Testament. The original audience is obviously referring to the physical Jerusalem. This is actually mostly written by David, King David himself or one of the psaltery uh, writers, they are definitely referring to the capital of Israel. Okay, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. Is there any wonder Jerusalem is so hotly contested these days? I would say the Lord builds up Jerusalem. Not so fast that we just swipe it off and go straight to Israel to the church, which is a spiritual Israel, which is a pre preeminence, which is much bigger. The ultimate, the ultimate Jerusalem is the church of Jesus Christ. But that context refers to the natural Israel and the Jerusalem of the city, city of God at that time. You know, what, what God has uh, shown and given to the people wanting the people to really pray for the city of Zion. Oh, even the word Zion is, now has connotation to Zionism and all this, which I will not go into. But right now, just a thing about God is asking, God is promising He will build up Jerusalem, which, no, it's not He will, He builds up Jerusalem. It's, <coughs> it's already done and it's go ongoing. It's a present tense. He builds up Jerusalem, uh, the, the, the physical Jerusalem, and the spiritual Jerusalem. That's where it gets a little bit funky because, because ultimately, if the natural Jerusalem is no repenting, no coming to Christ, not put their faith in Christ, but rejecting the Messiah, Christ, that Jerusalem is no good. <laughs> The natural Jerusalem is just just like anybody else who who doesn't believe in Christ. So that's why the Lord builds up Jerusalem. It's complicated. It's it's rather nuanced in that. Just give that a little bit a shot. He gathers outcasts of Israel. The word outcast is foreigners. Okay, those guys were outcasts from other nations. They come to uh, to uh, to Israel. The Lord our God received them and bring them into the house of God. See this is and what else? Verse three. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You know, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is such a beautiful expression of who God is. The God who goes out to uh, to actually heal the brokenhearted. We have so many brokenheartedness in this world as, as, as we see. We all struggle. We're all in a condition that's unbelievable because of the depravity of man. Because of the... Now, I don't want to blame the depravity of man because of satanic forces of evil force of the darkness. Even though the devil has been defeated on the cross, but he's not dead. He's not completely chained. 
he is still like Lucius Lewis say the uh, screw tape letter which I must read some days uh, saying that there's a cohort of demonic angels demonic evil spirits a cohort and uh, and they just uh, plotting how to bring down believers from their faith in Christ that is happening so you see that it, it is not so simple because the brokenness in this world is caused by two factors one is our human depravity and brokenness and the other one is beyond human is supernatural it's the spirit of evil it's that spirit of darkness a demonic prince of darkness who uh, instigates but above all I have shared it before the most potent weapon of Satan is lie deception that's how he brought down Adam and Eve the most potent one he comes in with a half truth half lie he brought down our super super ancestor Mrs. Adam Eve and Mr. Adam did nothing they joined the cohort of the fallen the earliest fallen and now we join the original sin we call the uh, the cohort descendants of the fallen and praise be to be our Lord our God our Lord Jesus Christ that he has offered himself sacrificed himself and uh, died on the cross that he may redeem us that we we are redeemed from this eternal damnation of darkness and hell fire praise be the Lord if you just hear that one line well, of your entire life and you believe in that one line is worth your entire life you can hear a thousand million lines from somewhere else but if you miss that line I just said everything is uh, everything is gone okay nothing is worth the while anymore everything is gone so we must we must make our utmost effort to get hold of that line it heals the brokenhearted and binds out the wounds how do you experience the healing of, of the Lord you know that that is his promise but we need to move into the promises of God to appropriately receive the healing. And remember, the healing is uh, is God's grace and kindness and goodness and mercy. That's what we depend on. That's what I cry upon. That bind up our wounds, O oh Lord. Verse 4, He determines the number of the stars. He gives all of them their names. Okay, it is really interesting you know first it started with it's good to praise our God now you know why <laughs> because apart from he's doing great things the healing restoration uh, helping his people being good and kind to his people he also names the stars what does that mean what that means is he's absolutely fantastically phenomenal that shows his power. His power is not just limited to healing human relationship brokenness and struggles and depravity and afflictions. He has that cosmic powers, even naming the stars in the sky. Everything's within his ability and control. He gives he gives all of them their names. That's why it's a complete spectrum. That's why we are so what so fitting that. Praise the Lord, sing his praises to our God. If you have not been singing praises to our God, you need to get back to church on Sunday morning and sing that praise to the Lord our God. Worship is electrifying. Yes, you heard me. Worship is deeply soul cleansing because you should be, that's who you are. When you sing praises to the Lord our God, in the congregation you really in the exact spot you were made for we were made by God to worship him to love him back 
because he loved us first to experience his goodness and his love towards us. This is clear and that must be understood clearly so that we feel joyful, we can feel whole. If you don't worship, you always feel truncated. Something is wrong, missing. You always turn into something to, to worship. What do you want on a Sunday morning? You want to go to watch football? You want to uh, do what now? Watch a movie? You know, it is just not the right thing to do. Sunday morning, hit the church and worship. Okay, so all people say, Sunday morning soccer practice. No, you don't go to practice on Sunday morning. You can do a Sunday afternoon and Saturday. Most games are on Saturday. So anyhow, that's a little bit of tidbits there. Um, verse five, great is our Lord and abundant in power. Now that comes from the verse before that he names all the stars in the cosmos. All right. Um, so verse five says, great is our Lord. Why is great is our Lord? You know, if you want to praise the Lord our God, just like what uh, Psalm 145, lots of all, all over the book of Psalms and all over the Bible, to praise the Lord, you need to know why. <laughs> you need to have some clear ideas of the greatness of our God and uh, who He is and what He does. Why is He so powerful? Why is He so gracious? Why is He so kind? Why is He so full of grace and all these good things, okay? Yes, great is our Lord, abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. He's abundant in power. He renamed the stars of the cosmic. And uh, what? His understanding is beyond measure. That's a, that's a mystery of God. He understands things that you can't even begin to imagine. So, there are things that we can never understand. His understanding is beyond mesh. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. You see, he's, even though he's mighty, he always looks out for the weak. The one struggles. You know, you can be struggle, but you can be a proud guy, you know. You never get anything from the Lord. But even if you are not struggling, but you humble yourself before the Lord, he will lift you up even further. That's the point. It's not about whether you are you're rich or poor or good condition, bad condition, whatever the case may be. You know, sometimes a lot of people will only humble themselves when they're in trouble. That's not good. Then you'll receive a lot of troubles before you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, okay? Because He loves you enough to do that. If He's indifferent, you know, that's it. There's nothing to talk about anymore. But since, since He cares for you and you are important to Him, it is really important that we remain humble before the Lord. You know, how do you remain humble before the Lord? When you are broken, when you're in trouble, when you are in, in deep waters. And that's the time you begin to think, what do I do? What can I do? You cry. You know, even the, the most ardent atheist in his drowning boat, if his sinking ship boat, oh, he's going to cry out. There's one word he's going to use, God, oh God, help me. You know, that, that's, a, that's a hypocrisy. When, when you are well, you reject God. You defy God. But you're in great need, you cry to God. Why cry to Him when you reject Him all this one? Do you think He's going to entertain you? Logical thinking that He's not. But by His mercy, He may. That's the mystery of God. That is where... You know, there are moments God used some real broken relationship to humble the people and turn them around. Like the greatest apostle, Paul, 
he was marching with the, uh, vengeance and demons and all this against the Church of Jesus Christ. He thought he's doing God a favor. He's breathing down threats and death upon Christian believers in Christ. And God struck him. Jesus struck him blind. For three days, he didn't eat any food or drink any water. That's the time. He was totally humbled. He was totally humbled. And he turned to God. And he became the greatest apostle. Man, that guy, the grace of God in him is incredible. Incredulous, beyond, beyond the world. And the amount of sufferings he went through, to carry on the uh, preaching of the gospel, establishing the Church of Jesus Christ, laying the apostolic foundation through his mighty epistles. He written the most books in the New Testament, more than everybody else combined, I think. That's, that is how much influence Paul has, has set on the uh, radar of the Christendom. Truly, an astounding man of God. All right, it's such amazing things. He cast the wicked to the ground. Verse seven, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. That's why we sing to the Lord. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. With all these things, who will not praise God? He gives to the beasts their food and the young ravens their cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, but his pleasure in the legs of not nor his pleasure in the legs of man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. Alright, so I will talk about that portion in the next podcast. But now I'm gonna end this one here. Uh, this is this almost 18 minutes of breaking small chunks uh, so that you can listen or you can go straight to YouTube and listen to the whole lot one shot. All right, stay tuned. More to come. May God works and be, may the Lord be glorified. May you know him more and more and enjoy him more and glorify him more and more. Amen.